What is the silliest rumor you have ever heard about yourself? I'm dead. <laughs> if you have any requests, uh, stuff it. Uh, because these are all the songs I know, and I'm doing them all. She jumped on the wag after our song hit the charts in her teens. She was a real good looker, but she never looked my way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She sat on the stage everywhere we went while we played the boogie woogie. She had a heart of gold, but uh, not a lot to say. I got a standing ovation. Oh, wait a minute. You're all standing. Hi, this is Peter Tork. I'm the eldest of four children born to John and Virginia Torkelson. And I first blinked the cold light of day in Washington, D.C. on February 13, 1944. My brothers and sisters' names are Nick, Christopher, and Anne Elizabeth. At the University of Connecticut, I played fourth chair French horn in a college band. I wasn't really interested in pop music then but Doug Ray Charles and the Beatles when they came out. Once I got on a stage, it was all over. I knew I had to be some kind of entertainer. I loved it. So I'd like to invite James Lee Stanley to the Monkey's Pad, a um, singer, songwriter, and longtime personal friend of Peter Tork. How are you doing today, James? All right, man. All right. How about you? It's very bright over there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Evidently, this is the uh, center of the universe. I didn't realize it, but this is where all the light emanates from, and it's so, all over my face. <laughs> so, James, you met Peter Tork when you were 17 years old. It's true. We met at Virginia Beach in, uh, I think it was 1964, the summer of 1964, and he was playing the banjo behind a group called the Phoenix Singers. He and another man named Lance Wakely were the two backup musicians, and uh, and I became friends with the two of them. Although I became closer to Peter almost immediately because the band was there for two weeks. And uh, in the weekend between the two weeks, they always had a uh, an open mic. They called it a hootenanny back then, but it was an open mic. It was on Monday evenings. And by the time the first Monday rolled around after they'd done a week, Peter and I had become so close that we decided to uh, work up a little thing. So we worked up three songs together and and performed together for the first time in 1964 uh we did a bunch of folk songs you know three folk songs and we just stayed pals it the uh the the connection was immediate and it never went away i, I remember also that july of that year was when when hard day's night came to virginia beach and peter and i went to see it and we came out of that that theater boy we were on fire you know we were we were so full of uh so full of the joy that the Beatles inspired, you know? It, it tore the top right off your head. It did. It did. And this was this was easily uh, two years, maybe two and a half to three years before the Monkees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What so a coincidence we, that uh, what, what a coincidence that uh, he would wind up being in the Monkees. What do you think your kinship was based on? Uh, well, you know, we both love music. Well, because I lived uh, near Virginia Beach, in the summer, the place was wide open. There was a million places to play. And then in the winter, uh, everything closed down. So I started my own club, a teen nightclub. It was called the Folk Ghetto. And we were only open on the weekends because I was still in high school. But on Easter week, we decided to make a big deal out of it. And I called Peter in New York City. And I invited him down as the headlining act. And he came down, stayed with my parents and I, and, and played the whole week and told me uh, afterwards that that was the first time he had ever been hired as Peter Tork to go out of town and be a headlining act. Before that, he was just playing basket houses and, and uh, once in a while getting a backup gig and playing behind someone else. So I, I gave him his first gig in a, and I think that he, I think that gave us a bond that just never went away, you know. And Describe his his show. Like, what what was his oh, show his, like? First of all, uh, many people don't know that Peter has a really rich baritone. had had a voice like it was like a cello, really rich and and uh, resonant, you know, and, and fun to listen to. 
Uh, when he got into rock and roll, he started trying to sing higher because I guess that's what people do in rock and roll. I don't know. In any event, uh, I, yeah, because like Led, Led Zeppelin, that guy sings up in the stratosphere. I think he just tried to sing higher. And back then, he was playing, you know, acoustic guitar and banjo. Uh, we didn't have a piano in the club, so he didn't he didn't use that. He, though he already played piano, because at our house he actually played the flight of the bumblebee for my parents and blew their socks off. You know, uh, uh, in any event, he would do folk songs, and and also he was very uh, very versatile. I remember that he not only did folk songs, but he did Who Will Buy from from the musical Oliver. He did Hard Day's Night, and he played that solo. You know, we we thought he was magnificent. If I had not been a member of the Monkees, my feeling is that I would have, in, in short order, become a popular performer in my own right, because that's what I do, and I would have just kept right on doing it. And this was 1965 now, 65. Who are his musical influences, according to what he's told you? Uh, well, uh Pete Seeger, you know, he he was mostly influenced by by folk music, by by the folk musicians, uh, and I th Pete Seeger is one that comes to mind most uh, readily. And I asked for a banjo. So my folks went out and bought me a, a little tiny dinky five string banjo, and and Pete Seeger's book, How to Play the Five String Banjo. I think I bought that myself and learned how to play from that. Nobody said here take a banjo or gee you'd be good at it or anything like that. I just wanted to play it. But he, but he also hung out with all those guys in in the village, you know, and, and traded songs. So he he knew all those people that were coming up. He and Stephen Stills were actually in a little group together for a little while, a trio. I've got a photograph of them somewhere around here. Uh, in any event, uh, he you know we were because we were young, we were essentially sponges. Everything was an influence. I mean, the, look at the fact that he did a Beatles song, a Broadway song, uh, a folk song, an Appalachian mountain banjo thing all in one show you know C clearly we were we were uh, we went to as many wells as we could find and we drew what, whatever resonated for us you know what was his musical aspirations yeah did he have any particular goals at that point that he wanted for his career you know what no he was uh you know when you're 19 years old and you're playing music you're already there <laughs> you're already where you want to be you know he wanted to play music. Peter loved loved playing music together. You know, he liked. Uh, I think he always wanted to be in a band. But uh, but he he was solo then, and he was he was really complete. He he uh, he did a real show, and and just there was never a moment when the show wasn't wonderful. You know. Now at some point you went off to Taiwan and didn't see Peter. Well, yeah, F after nineteen sixty five, uh, I. I joined the Air Force, and uh, then I was sent to Taiwan. So when I came back from Taiwan in 1969, the monkeys were already over. So I had essentially missed the uh, the monkey mania, you know. Mm -hmm. So Peter never. I'm not. I'm. It was. It took Peter's death for me to comprehend how famous he was because he was always just my pal Peter, you know. Which I think is part of the reason that we stayed such good friends because. You know, because uh, uh, he didn't get away with anything <laughs> with me, nor I with him. We we were pals and we would say, you know, we would just, you know, be people. Whereas w when someone achieves that kind of celebrity, everybody around them becomes essentially a psychophant, you know, feeding the, the thing. And it, I'm not sure how healthy that is. So I think he I think he recognized uh, the strength in a, in a real relationship. What was the. Uh Unabashed Peter Tork like nothing like like the character he played in the Monkees. The character is certainly a genuine part of who I really am. You know, I, I created that character on the Greenwich Village coffee house folk singing basket passing stages when I was a young entertainer in Greenwich Village. And I think what I was doing at the time was setting up a kind of a defense against the joke falling flat, you know, as if to say, well, somebody told me this joke was funny and, and I just, all I know is what people tell me and they must have been lying. <laughs> well, when you see his interviews and you see him on TV, what you see is what you get. He was the same. He was, that's who he was, man. He didn't have a, uh, a, a facade, though he did, he did assume a kind of a, a bravura when he was being interviewed that uh, that wasn't there. But, but you know, you kind of, 
when you get interviewed for uh, on a you know national TV or or you kind of puff yourself up a little bit, you know the way a, a bantam rooster would puff him up when he walks around the 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 yard, you know. So he would do a little bit of that, but I'm telling you, he was he was pretty straight, uh, Peter, the whole time that I knew him, and enormously generous and uh, and nurturing, you know. When you reconnected with him in 1969, was he still in his monkey mansion, you know, still in his big palatial estate? Uh, no, actually, uh, I, I had a break from, uh, I, I took some emergency leave when I was in Taiwan and I went home and, uh, and I did go down to L.A. for two days and I saw him. He was living in a place in Rogerton then in uh, Beechwood Canyon. He did not have, the, I, I never knew him when he had that that place in the valley, the big place that Stephen Stills ended up with. I never saw that place or, or even knew of it until, you know, years and years later. I saw him in Rogerton, and it was just at the time that they had finished uh, headquarters. It when you great. saw him in 69, he was still with Wren, and he had just had his... Oh, that's right. He and Wren came over, and Hallie had been born two days before. So that's like 1969, I think. Early 70, early 70. Oh, yeah, she was born. Okay. Okay, so he came over to the house then with uh, with Ren and Hallie. And as I say, Hallie was a newborn baby. And then we just kind of stayed connected after that. I remember going to another place up, I think it was in Laurel Canyon, but it might have been in uh, Coldwater Canyon, where I came into the house and and the foyer of the house had was corkboard. And it had about a thousand pictures of Hallie being born. You know, I mean, li literally Hallie crowning and then, you know, coming out of Wren, where all these photographs, and I had, <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that. I remember going, whoa, whoa, you know, because Wren was standing there and there, there were all these, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, a friend of his actually filmed her birth. Yeah, I've seen that film. Uh, David Crosby was in it and he was sailing and, and Allie was being born and, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of outrageous 60s stuff, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. You know? <laughs> so where was Peter's head at that point? He had left the monkeys on his own free will. Did he discuss that with you? Where was he at musically and personally at that he point? Wasn't, he wasn't doing music at all. Here I was a big success, mm -hmm. so I couldn't go be a folk singer again. Yeah. That was beneath okay. me. So I was paralyzed. Right, so you couldn't, couldn't do, do anything. anything. Yeah, right. So yeah. that was the pride of not being able to do the small stuff that really wrecked me. Yeah. And I, it's one of the penalties of that kind of instant success that, I've, uh, that I, I, I see myself coming to grips with. Uh, as I recall, at least we, we tried to play together. I remember one day, because Ren was playing the drums, so I know I went over there and we jammed doing that but uh he was still playing i remember that he showed me uh i'd never heard uh reggae music and he showed me this song johnny too bad and uh and he loved reggae music but it, it seemed like nothing he, that he was trying to do gelled and and then the next thing i knew he was uh he was in venice and he was teaching you know and then he joined the program. And I, I remember talking to him about that. He said that he he was teaching and he, he came home from class one day. What he used to do is come in and turn on the TV news and sit down and have a beer and watch the news. And he said that one day he looked down and saw the beer in his hand and he realized that he'd never, he had no recollection of even going to get the beer. And he didn't know which beer this was, whether it was the first or the 10th. I began to notice how many times I'd planned to have two beers and went to bed with the spins under the influence of nine, wondering how come how'd I get there. I began to notice the number of times that I had to apologize each morning for the behaviors of the night before. Uh, I began to notice whether I meant to or not how many times I went to bed with the spins, you know, and debating with myself, was I going to try to fall asleep and, and uh, behind all this, or was I just going to go into the bathroom and stick my finger down my throat? And, uh, I did that a lot. And he said, I realized I had a problem. So so he immediately, you know, just immediately addressed it. Uh, started going to uh, AA meetings shortly thereafter. 
I've told them how long I'm sober, and they go, God, you must have a lot of willpower. What I can tell you is that willpower kept me drunk. The more willpower I laid on myself, the less happiness I got, the less sober I got. My sobriety, my recovery, depended upon surrender. And then about two months later, stopped doing pot. I finally hooked up with a guy I wanted to be my sponsor, and uh, he said, well, I, I won't sponsor you if you keep on smoking pot. I said, you don't have to quit today. You don't have to quit tomorrow. He said, you can quit Tuesday. So Monday night. Well, in 1972, he was busted coming across the Mexican border. That's right. He did spend three months in jail. I learned my lesson with something about consciousness <laughs> and being aware of what's in your pocket when you come back across the border from Mexico. <laughs> What do you remember about that scenario? Yeah, so uh, he didn't talk about that much except uh, to tell me the fact that he had actually spent two or three months in jail. We were, you know, when you do those long tours together in the car, there's the two of you, you talk about everything, and that that came up at some point. And uh, he didn't have uh, much to say about it except the fact that I think he played some music in there and that people were, were uh, you know, nobody gave him any grief. He didn't have... He didn't have the problems that some people, could, celebrities could have if they were suddenly imprisoned, you know? The line from the Beach Boys song, I get around, the bad guys know us and they leave mm -hmm. us alone. Yeah. That's what it is, you know, the bad guy, they knew me and they left me alone. That was all there was to it, you know? It's just, they, you're gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to play your game. I'm not going to kowtow. No, I don't want to have anything to do with you. No, I'm not interested in getting in the middle of your game either. We just leave each other alone. Everything's okay. Fine. End of story. Did he tell you uh, what made him enter teaching? What, what was his impetus to begin that? Uh, well, I think, you know, when he left the monkeys, he had to sign away all of his rights to, uh, to any uh, future royalties. And so at, at all the money that was flowing in stopped. And to Peter's credit, money was never, it was never an inspiration for him. You know, he was glad when it showed up and he, he really didn't, didn't care about it. He, he was, you know, I mean, he, I think he gave David Crosby $25,000 to buy that sailboat or to, and so far as I know, David never paid him back. You know, I was going to ask you that it's an off, off reflected question. Did he ever get his money back? No, no. I mean, I, he told me he didn't, so I, I assume <laughs> that'll be correct. Was a time when I was so unassertive that if it came down to me or somebody else, you know, having something, anything, I figured probably better them than me. I mean, which it's a it's kind of a nice attitude, I guess, when it's done from a fully self-realized position. But at the time, it was from quite the contrary. It was feeling from a feeling of lack of worth, self-worth, which also accounted for that dummy character that I played. Uh -huh. when I was. But he didn't care. Money just was not a big deal to him. I, but he did have to. He did have a daughter, and he did have uh, expenses. That, you know, living expenses. And I think he became a teacher because he could. You know, he he must have uh, been offered some sort of situation, to, and he and he took advantage of it and taught for a while. I was kind of surprised to find out that I wasn't as good at it as I thought I'd, because I, I come from a long line of teachers. I'm a third generation on both sides of my family. So I really thought it was so much in my blood I didn't have to do anything. Turns out you had, there are a few things you have to do. So I wasn't as good as I thought I was, but uh, yeah, it was a whole lot of fun. I, I loved uh, participating with the kids. The first thing I ever did as a high school teacher in my English class, I knew that if I didn't take the chance, I would never get it again. I made the kids write what I did last summer. Did you really? I really did. Any surprises? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this was a liberal school. I mean, these kids were wild and wacky kids. Uh, and I know that he enjoyed it all of his life. Uh, one of the hats he liked wearing was teacher. You know, he liked, he liked being the, uh, the mentor, you know? So after he got sober, uh, he counseled people that oh. were interested in listening to him, didn't he? he? He never stopped doing that. I remember sometimes if anybody ever was in trouble, uh, anybody in his, in his, he always went to meetings, whether we were on the road or not at home in Connecticut, in Venice, there were always meetings and always available to anybody who was in trouble. There really is no such thing as neutral in this thing. If you're not working 
towards recovery in or you know or the equivalent if you're not working towards the higher good you are going to work for the lower evil you cannot help it there is no standing still i don't know why but that's just it's just a mechanical fact it's like gravity it's just one of those things it is sometimes even in the car uh he would get a call or call somebody and talk to them for an hour to, you know just to try to to uh, help them uh, alleviate the the stress of uh, of dealing with addiction you know he was he was enormously generous with his time. He always was available for that. Always. I, what do I'm, you think was the, uh, uh, the, where did he get his strength to stay sober all those decades? You know, uh, I don't know how to answer that because I don't know where any of us get our strength. You know, it, it, you make a, some of us have, some of us have enormous respect for, for our own word. You know, if I give my word, that's the end of that. You know, I can't, uh, I can't get out of it. You, like, if I gave my word to you, you could absolve me of of the responsibility of keeping my word, but I couldn't. And I'm pretty sure that Peter was the same way. If if he said he would do something, he did it. That's all. Well, somewhere in the late seventies, early eighties, he moved to New York. Do you remember that? I do, I do. We reconnected in New York. I remember it was a hard time because that was before the monkey re resurgence. And, uh, you know, after Michael had shot all the monkeys in the foot with his, uh, you know, tell them we're fake, that whatever that pronouncement he made, which was pretty disingenuous when you consider that that the, the musicians that played on the monkeys records also were the same musicians that played on the the association records, the Mamas and Papas, the Turtles, the Beach Boys, these same musicians called the Wrecking Crew played for everybody. And Michael made it sound like, like the Monkees were, were uh, less because these guys played on it. I don't know why he came out with that. I, 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 I know Michael and I, I certainly have a high regard for him, but I, I never understood why he did that. Uh, my notion is that Rafelson and Schneider had what I'm fond of calling a Geppetto complex. They actually did want to see their little puppets become real live boys. And we had Pinocchio complexes, and we wanted to be real live boys too. Uh, in fact, the movie had sort of documents in an abstract fashion all of that struggle on our parts. There is two or three very good movies. It's a very good psychedelic movie and a story about Psychogello. Two or, two or three good views of the monkeys. One of them is rather positive and one of them is rather negative. The business about how I say I'm the dummy, I'm always a dummy, that's a proper view of my attitude towards the whole thing. And at the same time, there is this sense in which Rafelson saw me as an empty-headed mouther of other people's philosophies. You know, he was a little negative about everybody. And it certainly didn't serve them. And, and so when I reconnect with Peter in New York, in the, I stayed with him. He was uh, he and Jennifer had a little place on the west side, and I stayed with them. And I remember we went down to the uh, what was that club? the China Club, and I took Peter down there, and and uh, I thought that a, a lot of the musicians you know disrespected him. Uh, he didn't play, but you know I introduced them to my pal Peter, and, and they were kind of like blowing him off a little bit. And I remember seeing you know that that pained look in his face as these guys were being rude and, uh, or, or condescending, not, not so much rude. It's just condescending. Like, Oh, you were the monkey, you know? And, and I know it troubled him and it troubled yeah, well, him. Their, their reputation was at, was at its nadir during the seventies yes, and it, it really was. didn't get uh, rehabilitated till later on after the yeah, reunion. It's true. And what, what's funny is that, uh, let's see, I, I can't remember. Do you, do you remember when the monkeys first, had a research. Oh, it was because of MTV. MTV re began rebroadcasting the monkeys. Yeah, it's May of '86, I think, was the first show they did. Okay, so so that's when Peter started uh, when they started giving him, you know, some regard. It's enjoyable. Part of me goes uh, the same as it did the first time, just exactly the same as it did the first time. What's it got to do with me, you know? And what does it all mean? And part of me goes, this is wonderful. Maybe it's just a way to uh, to collect some leftover karma which you've got to do regardless, you know, whether it's in the monkey guys, whatever the story, whatever you're doing, you've got your karma to work through. There were probably were a few left over, a few loose ends that, uh, that I didn't pick up on the last time that I have to pick up this time. 
And that's another reason that we were we were friends for life, because I saw him really shine when, the, you know, there were no monkeys. The monkeys idea wasn't even on the horizon. And and he did, you know, he was a wonderful performer and a wonderful musician. And and uh, and I saw him like that. And I think the fact that that he got that from me, that kind of respect all through that that period probably helped the bond as well. And I, re I remember that after the monkey's resurgence, uh, I think it was about, it might have been 90, 91 or something. And I said, Peter, why haven't you made a record? All these guys have made us solo records and you haven't. And he was so humble. He just said, well, you know, no one has asked me. And I said, <laughs> I said Jesus, Peter, I have a studio. I have, it's behind me. I have a studio. I have a record label. I have distribution. Uh, I said, why don't we, you know, at some point make you a solo record and and uh, and we'll shop it, you know. And the worst case scenario, if literally nobody likes it but us, we can put it out on my label, which is distributed by Capital. So we can't lose, you know. And, uh, you know, I just I just said, let's let's just do that. And, and I must admit that that my vision of the first album, because I had seen him perform you know, this uh, organic acoustic music. I wanted to present him doing those uh, those banjo things. You know, I wanted to make essentially an acoustic record so that I could demonstrate that there was no, no phony stuff behind him, that he was the guy doing this stuff. Yeah, it was and, organic, and very that, organic musician. Yeah, and but I wanted, to, I wanted to present that so that it would shift people's perception of him so that... Yes, he's, he, he was a monkey and he was famous and he was a teen idol. He was also always this musician. He, he played the acoustic guitar. He really played the guitar. He really played the banjo. He really played the piano. And I, was, I wanted to do that. But he said, James, you know, I'm not that guy anymore. I want to do a rock and roll. I'm a rocker. I want to do a rock and roll record. And I want to do, you know, and I like all these synths and stuff. And I said, okay, well, I mean, let us, let me see what I can do to help further your vision. One of the things I've always done as a producer is try to figure out what the vision of the artist was and then serve that. And I learned that from reading about George Martin, who never discouraged the Beatles. He never said, that's a stupid idea. We can't do that. He always, he always tried to help bring to life whatever the vision was that the artist had. And so that's what I tried to do with the Stranger Things Have Happened. I tried to just you know, assist him in, in uh, realizing that vision. And what do you, uh, the results are, are different than we're used to. It's like you said, he was a folky and, and I think he shines best with his, with that brand of, of delivery. How were you, were you happy with the production on that? Uh, you know, it, as I say, it wasn't the record that I, that I wanted to make with him, but it was the record he wanted to make. And, uh, and to tell you the truth, I I don't listen to uh, a lot of the stuff that I produce. I, I well, let me rephrase that. It is fun to go back and hear a record I produced before because I don't listen to it after I produce it. After it's when it's first done, I've already been listening to it every day for a year or two. So, you know, I, I tend to not listen for a while. But but I did listen to the the uh, they just did a re-release of, of as you know of uh, Stranger Things Have Happened with a bunch of alternative cuts and all that. And so I went back and revisited the record. And I'll tell you the truth, I like it a lot. I was I was genuinely surprised at uh, how much I liked it. You know, it, 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 was, it was Peter's thing, not mine, and it sounded like a Peter record. It didn't sound like one of my records. Uh, if you listen to my stuff, it's it's much different than that. But I liked it, you know. And I, I thought it was very inventive and uh, very varied. How did Peter change over the decades that you knew him? Did he develop or change you know what? markedly? Or? Yeah, to tell you the truth, when we first went on the road together, I remember we were in Texas. And uh, some fans came up and they were, they were just, you know, coming at him with all this monkey stuff. And, and, and I thought he was very short with them and uh, impatient, you know. And we got in the dress room and, and, and I said, Peter, 
you know, you were unkind to those people. They, they love you. And, and he, and he said, I, I was, I said, I said, what, what you said was mean spirited. And he flipped out mean spirited. I never miss me. Mean spirited. Do you intimidate people? Yeah, I'm afraid I do sometimes. I don't mean to particularly, but part of it's from that insecurity. You know, one of the reasons that people build up these uh, skills at, say, intellectualization uh, is... It, Feeding the monster. Well, it's, it's, it's out of insecurity, you know, and uh, when you're raised thinking... And I was raised basically with the tenet of perfection is barely tolerable. <laughs> and I said, well, Peter, the fact that these people care that you want to make music, that's... You should be on your knees gr grateful that the, that anybody cares because there's so many of us that making music, you know, and the fact that these people love you and want to hear that stuff that that was playing when they were growing up at, you know, during their, the nascency of their, of their uh, realization of their personness, you know, you've got to, you have to be kind to these people. And we had, we had like a little tiff about it for, I guess about a, uh, we went on stage. He was still upset, but we came off stage, and he, he flipped. The people came up, and he was kind. And I never saw him do that again. You know, he. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. What I'm saying is that is that he recognized that he was being. He was trying to deny his past, and I said that's ridiculous. Your past is what it is. It will never change. And and what you should do is enjoy. Enjoy the fact that, that you had this past and not deny it, but embrace it. And certainly, if you take the latter half of the 1960s, for a good three, four years, the monkeys were a major force in American pop music. <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious to see your reaction now. It's what would you say were the, the greatest qualities that you admired that he possessed? Well, I... Uh, I've never known anybody more generous and I've never known anybody more loyal, you know? And he was, you know what? He was an honest dude. As a matter of fact, he was almost, uh, <laughs> he was almost too honest because he, he, he didn't filter. I think that's why a lot of people misinterpreted him early on because he would say what he thought or, or if you asked him a question, he'd tell you, you know, the truth as he saw it. And, uh, and in America, we tend to be more involved in, you know, glad handing and and bullshitting people rather than saying, hey, you know, that wasn't uh, whatever. A lot of people weren't don't do that. And Peter did that. He was he was a straight shooter. You know, he always said what he thought, and and he tried to uh, to live by by the code that he uh, that he embraced. You know, which is pretty rare. I think, you know, so he was generous and he was loyal and, uh, yeah. And he just knew how to be a friend, man. He was, he was a friend of mine, you know? How would you describe his ability, uh, to have that? He had a great repartee and ability to improvise and interact and connect with his audience, which always amazed me. What do you recall of, I'm sure you've witnessed that plenty of times, you know, uh, Th that is, that's something that that may be another bond because we we shared that it was always we were as relaxed on stage as we were off stage you know and and able to to uh to spontaneous maybe it's because neither one of us ever worked up bits like a comedian has a you know essentially a joke set list and he you know we never had that we always worked on utter spontaneity ready <laughs> and uh our entire lives so it's just a muscle that it it was a muscle that was always there and and consequently easy to use you know peter was always personable uh and always likable. And uh, so far as I know, uh, so was I. I. I remember on one tour, did I tell you the story? We, we were, uh, I think we were on the west side of Missouri, or the middle of Missouri, 
and we were in his Acura. It was the very first tour, and his his Acura chaining uh, timing belt broke. So so I said it's not a problem. I've got AAA. I called AAA, and this guy came and picked us up and towed the truck into St. Louis. I mean, to, I mean, excuse me, towed the Acura into St. Louis, and and dig this. It was going to take all day for that Acura uh, timing belt to be changed, and we were on the way to. Uh, that Pete Seeger thing with the, with the that he does for the river every year, uh, named after that sailboat of his. It's in New Jersey. It's a I can't think of the name. Damn, I, this maturity is challenging stuff. In any event, uh, I said to the manager of the Acura dealership, "We need a room because we have to rehearse. And, I mean, we're going to spend the day doing nothing. So let's give us a room and we'll just go in there." So Peter and I went into this big conference room. And uh, went in the corner and we just started rehearsing. And word got out that Peter Tork was <laughs> was playing music in the in an Acura dealership. And inside of an hour, we had about 200 people jammed into that room and hanging out the doors. And so we did our first show together at an Acura dealership in, in St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> Completely impromptu, and we and we did that. We related everybody and talked to them and laughed and had a great time. You know, he just he always did that. It's what it's you know what it's also part of that folk tradition that, that we come out of that thing where you do talk to the audience and you do amuse them and you do interact with them. It's not like uh, stadium rock, you know, where it's a this big performance and there there's a, there's security guards and a wall between you and the audience. In uh, acoustic music, there is no wall at all. You know what I've always done between every show and every show is I do a set which lasts about an hour, and then I go out in the audience. I go out, and even when I played, I was Stephen Wright's opening act for three years, and even when we played the Universal Amphitheater for like eight thousand people, I literally <laughs> put down my guitar, walked off the stage, and. Uh, and I had a case of uh, LPs and, and I started yelling over here, meet the artist. And I walked through the crowd <laughs> up to the lobby and they all came out. You know, I mean, it's, that's a, that's a folk tradition, man, that, uh, that interaction and that availability, you know. How would you rate Peter as a songwriter and what are your favorite, some of your favorite songs that he wrote? Uh, he, he, he was always trying to, to do something you hadn't heard, which is pretty rare because many of the hit songs you hear are derivative. They're, they sound like some other hit song. Peter always wanted to write something that you hadn't heard before. Of uh, of his of his songs, I really like that. Uh, you get what you pay for. I decided to, to actually record that. I did a concert last month and uh, and included that song and and really thought, oh, I really like that song. Let's see, Sea Change. He wrote, I always like that. Uh, I meant it to be ambiguous. I wrote it uh, specifically so that you, so that it would not be uh, clearly a positive thing or a negative thing. It's to say that everything is in the song. I didn't. There's no hidden keys that once you know things fall into place. Everything is in the song. I don't know if you've heard the lyric. Uh, I drank your deep sea waters, kneeling at your shore. Felt the changes in my body. Came crawling back for more. Screeching seagulls, moaning whales, dare me to exist. Do I enter Mother Ocean? Do I dare resist? I give up. I surrender to your charms. Take me down into your depths and let me drown in your arms. Take me down. Tender is the chops. Oh, tender is. Yeah, I, I remember that. I sit at the piano almost all the time. I think about my such a long, long Yeah, I mean, his writing was interesting, you know, and, and fun to play, always surprising. What were his relationships like with the other monkeys through those years, post-monkey years, when he was touring with them? And did he socialize uh, no, with them? Oh, oh, no question. He got along best with, with uh, Davey. I think in, in order of, of connection, it was Davey, Mickey, and Michael. You know, and Davey... Davey was just such a personable, funny guy and very available. You know, I, I remember he came to the studio and just cracked us up. And Peter and I realized 
we didn't get him to sing, you know. <laughs> that was a funny hour. He saw Davey go out on stage and just sit down on the edge of the stage with the guitar and enthrall the crowd. He said it was like such a wonderful, wonderful moment for him to watch watch Davey just absolutely in rapture uh, this entire audience just sitting with the guitar. I think he was playing a song called I Want to Be Free. So it was def definitely Davey first. And uh, and then Mickey, the last time I saw Mickey was at the, Peter did that show at the Grammy Museum, you know, when he, that tour that he did uh, uh, t towards the end of his life. That's the last time I saw Mickey. Mickey was always nice. And Michael, you know, Michael tried to sign me to his label. So I knew him a little bit as well. I think that Michael and Peter did not have the uh, the warmth that he and Davey had. And I know that he uh, he and Mickey had some some difficulty, and mostly because Peter was busy telling uh, he wasn't filtering how he presented the truth to uh, some other band members, and it it caused them a lot of uh, a lot of problems. I mean, yeah. it caused the band problems. That, that, uh, so there was some some estrangement between he and Mickey, but I do know that Mickey loved him, you know. And and Michael, I think he was less available uh, as a as a friend to Peter. I know that the, that he and Davy had a problem when, you know, Davy really liked his his sauce, you know, and uh, they put together one tour, and Peter said he'd only go on the tour if Davey would promise not to drink. And Davey promised. But Davey's perception of it was, I, I won't drink before the show. But after the show, if I want to drink, I'll have one. And that wasn't Peter's perception of it. And uh, I think he quit the tour because of that. Because I remember talking to him and saying, Peter, if he drinks after the show, it's none of your business. If he drinks before the show and it impacts the show you're doing together, you have a legitimate bitch, but I don't think you're being fair to him. And he said, well, no, the, the deal was, you know, cause I told you Peter's word was his bond. And as far as he was concerned, Davey was not to have a drink on that tour. And Davey did not ever drink before a show, but he would go and have a drink afterwards or maybe 10. I don't know. I, I was never there for that. I do know that he liked his cups, you know, and that's the reason that, that he quit that tour. Yeah, I think that was around 2001. Yeah. Yeah. So how did they reconcile? Because obviously they played again. Yeah, you know what happens, man? Over time, you start realizing, you know, something that seems so enormous at the at the moment it happens always evolves into uh, it assumes its proper its proper perspective over time. And I think that uh, you know, I, I I mean, because Peter and I talked about that a couple of times, and I I think that uh, that he did come around to the idea that well, you know. He didn't let us down for the shows. If he wanted to do whatever he wanted afterwards, really, it wasn't my business. You know, I think that's what he came to. And and so they also, Davey just, he didn't seem to carry a grudge, that guy, you know. What was Peter's reaction to Davey's death emotionally? And uh, did it, you know, at that time he was ill uh, himself. Yeah, yeah so Peter had a lot, a lot on his plate, but I remember he was, we were both kind of stunned, to tell you the truth. I know that Davey was always, I mean, if I played in Florida, I, I always invited Davey to the shows if I was where he might be. And he always called or, or you know, uh, left a message. Or something. Like when I played in Florida, I invited me and he called me and he said, James, I'm I'm up in Pennsylvania at my ranch. But, you know, thanks for the invitation. I mean, he was he was always gracious like that. So I, f I felt more connected to, to Davey than, than to Michael and Mickey. And I was floored because it was so unexpected. It just just yanked the rug out from under us, you know. And Peter, because he was dealing with with uh, with that sublingual cancer thing, he was. I think 
he was kind of expecting to be the guy that goes first and to have Davy just slip away like that. He was pretty stunned. I know the morning I heard, I, I, I wrote, wrote a song for him. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was, uh, yeah. In early 2009, Peter was diagnosed with a condition called adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is a rare cancer. It was under his tongue. They cut me open pretty good. They unzipped me from here to here and then broke my jaw, <laughs> actually cut my jaw, opened it up to get at what was growing on the bottom of my tongue. Did it change his perspective or... Did he try to no, live he, like he was he, he was very uh, very strong and uh, and pragmatic about it, and it didn't seem to uh, you know, it didn't seem to really like you know depress him or or frighten him. It was it was like another hurdle in this long race, you know. So, uh, and I I was kind of amazed at the way he handled it. He was very strong about it and and pragmatic and I, I and i think that helped me when when i was diagnosed with mine i know that i spoke to him two days before he passed oh no no he called me in the fall and he said james i'm going to stop taking all the medicines because it's not working and i said what does that mean pal and he said it means that uh that i'm you know we're folding my tent. He said, I'm hoping to make Christmas. And at Christmas, we talked a long time on the phone, Christmas Day. And he said, well, I'm hoping to make my birthday. And, and I thought, this is amazing that he's, you know. And then when I spoke to him two days before he passed, he said, I said, Peter, it's James. What are you doing? And he said, I'm just waiting. Wow. And then he was gone, you know. I miss him every day, every day. Well, you mentioned Pam. How long were they together before they were married? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I know that he met her at a, at a meeting and uh, in the program and that they were friends for a while. And then she moved into the place in Connecticut and then they got married. And, you know, just the way those things evolve. But but by that time, uh, Peter was really involved with the blues band. You know, he. My understanding, I I heard from uh, a previous uh, uh, enamorata of Peter's that in the early years of this century, I don't remember exactly when, uh, he and I were playing and he was playing with the band, uh, with the blues band. And the members of the blues band said, look, you know, when you go out with James, we don't work. And so if you want to have this band, you have to choose between whether you want to go out with James or want to go out with the blues band. So he came to me and he said, uh, James, I, you know, I'm thinking that uh, I've got to make a commitment here. And I said, well, you know what, pal, I've been a solo performer most of my life. You love this blues band. Be with the blues band. You know, it's not, uh, it's not going to affect our, our relationship at all. And so he went with the blues band at that point, you know, we toured differently and we, and he lived on a different coast. So I saw him a whole lot less. We did mo mostly on the phone. If he was ever in town, uh, we, we would certainly get together. And whenever I was on the East coast, I would base my tours out of his house. So, you know, I'd stay there and then go out wherever I was. So we stayed in contact like that, but I didn't, I wasn't there for the blossoming of, of his, uh, his relationship with Pam. And I didn't meet her until they were already, you know, a solid item. So I, I can't speak too much, except that she was always very gracious to me, you know? Well, he, when you did his album, he you told me he was a rock and roller. And then he made the transition to want to be a blues man. Do you remember, Do you know what caused that transition? You know what? This is interesting. He, this was after we did uh, Stranger Things Have Happened, or perhaps maybe even during. There's a place called Harvell's in Santa Monica. Oh, he was dating a girl in Santa Monica. And I think that she liked to go to Harvell's. So he, uh, he would go to Harvell's on Tuesday nights and it was an open blues jam. And, and after a couple of weeks, somebody invited him up to play and he, and he went up there and he played a blues song. He really liked it. 
So he started going every week to Harvell's. And then he would, he started buying blues records and he started practicing. I think that he just really liked the freedom of slipping into a, such a solid form of music and enabling him to just, you know, within that, uh, within those scales, just play anything. And he became more and more enamored of it. And then he decided he wanted to have his own blues band, Shoe Sway Blues. And now, why couldn't thing, you have performed with him in that? It wasn't it an uh, option? Because uh, for me, most blues is bores me. The blues is not about the blues, not really. The blues is the top is the is the nominal subject matter, but the blues is about how we're all in this together. You sing the blues, and I know somebody else has been through what I've been through, and I'm not alone. That's what the blues is about. You know, it, the progressions are always the same and the melodies are frequently the same and the words are repetitive. And, and, uh, if you listen to my records, you'll find that they're a little bit more complicated, uh, chordally and, and melodically. And I also like shifting key centers. I, I just like a different kind of music than blues. That being said, I've still heard some blues that tore the top of my head off, you know, uh, Freddie King and and Buddy Guy. I mean, you know, and Corky Siegel from Chicago is one of my favorite people and one of my dearest friends. But the blues never spoke to me like it spoke to Peter. So I, I didn't have any interest. It just doesn't resonate for me with the same kind of thing that Miles Davis does or, or the Beatles, which came. I mean, I know they came out of rhythm and blues too. You know, it every, it res music is is really personal. It resonates differently to, for every person. You know? Peter had two children, Hallie and Ivan. Uh, did you know them well? And what was his relationship with them over the years? Uh, I didn't know them well. I, I, I've, I've met Hallie a number of times, and I've always found her delightful. And uh, Ivan, I haven't seen in years. I remember that he came and sat in with, with us one time when we played Monterey, and he played uh, percussion. He was always a nice kid. I just, I never got to know them because they they had their own lives and and their own circle of friends, you know. And also, they were much, much younger than me. And young people don't tend to not want to uh, hang out with somebody, you know, so vastly uh, more mature, uh, at least in terms of longevity, than them. You know, so I didn't really know them except to say that they were always a delight when I when I knew them. Did he ever express to you what his motivation was to leave the monkeys in the first place? He really wanted to be in a band. He wanted to make music in a band. And I think the other guys weren't that enamored with that particular idea. They were in the, the monkeys and it was a, you know, a, a pop phenomenon, but they didn't, uh, he wanted to be a, a band. He wanted to, you know, let's rehearse five hours every day and let's when you get famous in a group and you leave that group i believe that it's natural to assume that the fame that you achieved is going to travel with you and and uh when he left the monkeys the monkeys fans stayed with the monkeys and and all of a sudden he wasn't and plus you know he gave up all that money so he didn't have the kind of uh he couldn't put together a band and put them on retainer and, and rehearse six hours a day. You know, he couldn't, he didn't have that machine. He may have regretted it initially, but I don't think he regretted it. But, you know, he slowly just refused to stop doing it. He went back. He took some side roads, but he always came back to music. And, and after a while, he just refused to do anything else, you know? When the monkeys had their big resurgence in 1986 that changed all his money problems there that he was suffering with for the years before financial security and acceptance and so he must have been on cloud nine through that period oh no it, it really it really lifted lifted his his spirits lifted his uh sense of self-worth you know and it also gave uh, it like redeemed him from that uh from that bullshit of of them being unworthy of the you know i mean they weren't milli vanilli you know but uh but there was a perception that they kind of were, and, and he was he was redeemed from that. So he loved it. I remember he said the funniest thing. Nick, his brother, uh, 
came and I guess we were sitting somewhere and and Nick said, wow, Peter, so uh, how is it, man, having all this money now back, you know, finally getting this money? And Peter said, I love it. I'm already beginning to despise the poor, <laughs> which was sarcasm. He didn't mean it for real, but it was it was so wonderfully funny. Yeah. I, I you, ha Having the money. Oh, yes. I'm already I'm already despising the poor. It was, it was so funny. A perfect Peter remark. You know? What was his relationship with Nick like? Always great. Always great. He always loved it. When he played for me at the Folk Ghetto in 1965, he played Nick Torgelson songs. He played Under the Undertaker. And uh, he just always loved his brother and always admired his brother. His brother told me, after Peter passed, I was talking to Nick, and Nick told me the most beautiful thing. It made me weep, man. He said, uh, James, I don't know whether Peter ever told you this, but after, after you produced his solo album, and you guys went out on tour and started doing this thing again, he told me that you gave him his life back. I was floored. I didn't think that he, I mean, I thought he always had his life, you know? I didn't realize that he'd been so uh, estranged from what he wanted to do. But I just did it because I wanted to help, you know? When he would have to go back out with the monkeys, was it something he looked forward to or was it more of a, a financial responsibility? How was? How did he enjoy those last four or five tours with the monkeys? Well, I think he enjoyed them uh, I think he thoroughly enjoyed them. The, the fact that he went out, because he got to go out and, and play and do his thing, and, and he liked it when, you know, uh, you're a musician, aren't you? Yes, I would say so. Yeah. You know how some you'll go out and you'll play a set or, or an evening, and some time during the course of the evening, the entire band clicks, locks in, and gels sometimes for, a, you know, only a verse or sometimes for a song, sometimes for like a set, but something happens where it, there's just this magic connection, this soul bonding thing. And, and, uh, and he was always looking for that. And, and, you know, he, he would say, man, if we were playing and just, you know, something clicked and we locked in. Yeah. He loved it. He, I think he liked it more than in the beginning, tell you the truth. It happens a lot less than people would probably Realize oh, no. it's absolutely true. You you can play all evening and just and just hit that 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 magic spot for, uh, but that's what keeps you going. You know, <laughs> just just trying to make that happen again. You play a million dates. You know, what made him laugh? <laughs> Actually, man, uh, I seem to make him laugh a lot. I remember saying things on stage where he would literally dropped to his knees laughing at, at some of those lines. Uh, he just, he, he loved, the, he loved the spontaneous thing that, you know, he liked the, uh, the, the surprise turn. If it, if it looks like you're going to the right and you go left, that always made him laugh, you know? And, uh, and irony was, was a big, a big thing with him. And he loved, he loved the, uh, the really clever stuff like Flanders and Swan or, or, Tom Lira. We will all bake together when we bake. There'll be nobody present at the wake. With complete participation in that grand incineration, nearly three billion hunks of well done steak. You know, those kind of people that would write not only funny, but perspicacious kind of funny, you know. Uh, he, he always said that Danny Kay was an early influence yeah he did say that i i remember he liked danny k a lot now a long time ago these teeth walked into my office and i said do i know you and they said no but you've taken out some of our friends <laughs> my parents saw danny k do a show in uh 
in Philadelphia. And he went on for about three and a half hours. It was just him by himself. And he just winged it. And, uh, and I think Peter really admired that kind of, that kind of, you know, the way Robin Williams could just go on and on. He liked that kind of thing a lot, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, riffing. like be, being able to just riff. Yeah, to riff. He liked, he liked uh, Lenny Bruce. You know, the, the people that didn't do shtick, he liked, he liked the humor that was spontane spontaneous. And what pissed him off? Uh, you know, uh, a lack of integrity uh, pissed him off and, and uh, falseness, you know, when people were simply phony. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't respond well to phony, you know. He didn't like that. How much money do you need? You know, Peter didn't understand that kind of greed. He yeah, didn't he proved that money. Peter needed a lot of money to be happy and, and, and live on his own. He's proven that numerous times in his life. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the fact of the matter is, is that is that money can make your life more comfortable and it can also do enormous good. But when you start using money as like a scorecard or... or I know that, that people get a lot of money and they start thinking that they deserve it, you know, or that they're somehow better or, or more worthy. You know, here's when you have a lot of money, it doesn't mean that you're more intelligent or, or more worthy or more valuable as a person. It means you have a lot of money. That's all it means. And, and how you behave with that money is what makes up, you know, who you are. I mean, we would do tours where he would come off a monkey's tour where he had, you know, limos and uh, and people carrying his guitar and 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 booklets that laid out everything you did for the for the tour, and then I'd pick him up in a rented Dodge Stratus that I drove, and we would drive across the country together, schlepping our own stuff, and uh, staying in like one hotel room with two beds, you know, to save money, and and uh, and I realized that he didn't have to save any money; he was doing that for me, you know. And he demanded that we split the door, even though I know that everybody was coming to see Peter. You know, they were not coming to see me, but he still demanded I split the door with him, which I thought was enormously generous. When, when Peter and I did tours, I always made more money than him, which is, is astounding. You know, how many how many artists would do that would be, you know, let me help you out, pal. You know, what did Peter spend his money on? Well, I know he loved his little BMW, and uh, he spent a lot of money uh, refurbishing the house and the barn that his parents owned in Connecticut. You know, and he, and he was generous. He gave a lot of money to his, uh, anybody that needed it. He and spent a lot of time traveling with Peter on the road. There's got to be some stories or some moments that come to mind of incidences that happened during all that travel and loading and unloading and, you know, you find yourself in Podunk, Podunk, uh, Illinois, or where you got stuck or you couldn't make a gig or you took somebody's jacket by accident, you know, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Well, you know about that jacket thing. <laughs> okay. I remember, uh, one time we, we were, uh, he wanted to, when we first started touring, he wanted to drive, but Peter drove like he was immortal and, I'm not kidding. When he was driving, I was constantly in fear of my life. <laughs> and so I, I uh, for the next tour, I said, you know what, pal, uh, it turns out that it costs a lot more money for us to rent a car with two drivers. So why don't you let me be your driver and, and I'll just be the guy that drives. And, you know, then there'll be one person, you know, one person driving the car and it would cost less. And he went, okay. <laughs> Well, how bad was it? How bad was his driving? How bad was it? You know, 80 miles an hour tailgating somebody. <laughs> That's bad. He, I mean, he would sw switch lanes and it, it just was, you know, I, I, I was constantly in fear of my life. And he always drove like that. I remember we, we were, he had his MGB GT and I had a, my, I guess I had my MGA and we were driving in Mulholland. And, you know, I just, I couldn't keep up with him because I, I because I was afraid I was going to go off a cliff, you know? So there was that. 
Were yeah. there any mishaps or you couldn't make a gig oh, or when something actually, went wrong? You know what? Actually, yes. I remember there were a couple of those. Uh, two separate occasions, Peter forgot his guitar. One time we were on our way from Connecticut to uh, Cafe Lena up, up in the Saratoga Springs, New York. And we had loaded in at his house. And we were in, I guess we were in my rental car. And we get there and I started loading stuff. And I said, Peter, where's your guitar? And he said, well, isn't it in the trunk? I said, no, no, I, I loaded my stuff in. And then I sat in the driver's seat with the car warming up, waiting for you to load your stuff in. So he called the house and it turned out the guitar was still sitting in the snow in the driveway. So we had to drive around like maniacs trying to find somebody on a Sunday that would rent us a guitar for that show. And another time, uh, we were on tour on the East Coast and we had played Philadelphia, the Tin Angel. And I said, look, our next gig is down in Newport News. So I'd like to drive down to Newport News get there a day early because we have dinner with this DJ and we're doing this broadcast you know, interview thing. And then we're doing the show the next night. It says, let's just go where we have to be. And then we can just relax. And Peter said, no, man, I, I want to go to Atlantic city. And I said, well, you know, why don't we go where we have to be? And then, then, then there's no pressure because we're already where the next gig is. So we don't have to like, no, no, I want to go to Atlantic city. And I said, all right. And he said, I'll tell you what, just take me to the Philadelphia airport. I'll fly to Atlantic City and then you can pick me up and we'll go down. And I said, all right. So I, he gets to the air. I, I pull up at the airport. I pick him up and I said, where's your guitar? And he goes, it's in Atlantic City. And I said, what? So I said, get in the car. And so we drive like maniacs from the Philadelphia airport all the way to Atlantic City. <laughs> we get to Atlantic City and, and I said, so where where are you? Where did you stay? And he said, I, I can't quite remember. I think it was, uh, you know, so we drove around Atlantic City for an hour and a half. We find the neighborhood and we finally find the house. We go there. No one's home. The doors are locked. So I'm looking at the house and I walk around it and I see up on the second floor, there's a, a window open over the back porch. So I grabbed a hold of the rain spout. And, it, and I climbed up on top of the roof and I ripped the screen off and I went in the second floor bedroom window, which happened to be his bedroom. There was his guitar sitting there. I picked up his guitar. I went downstairs, came out the front door and I said, here, you owe these people a screen. I was so angry. So we get in the car and he said, listen, James, we don't have to drive back to Philadelphia. We can drive down to Cape May. We can catch a ferry and it'll take us right across. And then we'll be like, you know, an hour and a half from Newport News. And I said, is that ferry still run? Oh, yeah, it's great. So we go down there. The ferry doesn't run anymore. So we have to drive back up and cross over into Philadelphia and then drive all the way back down to Newport News. We missed the dinner with the DJ. We missed doing the live interview. <laughs> and we got, I was so angry, man. You know. But, I mean, to, to be fair, He'd come off of a monkey tour where people carried his guitars. He didn't have to think of that stuff, you know? Right. And, and so it was an abrupt change for him to suddenly have to be his own roadie. So, I mean, I forgave him, you know? But but for that day, I was mightily pissed, you know? <laughs> Why was he so hell-bent to go to Atlantic City for two days? Was he staying at someone's home or? Yeah, he stayed with some friend. I, I think, uh, you know, Peter, Peter was very fond of women, and, and I suspect that uh, that there was a that there was a woman involved, you know. He I mean the night the night before we went to Saratoga Springs for Cafe Lena, we'd been playing in a, in Rhode Island, and he he wanted to go off with with some lady, and I said, Peter, we we have to drive all the way back to your house. We have to get up in the morning and drive to Saratoga Springs. Why don't you get the girl's phone number and you can see her the day after tomorrow or something? No, I really want, and I and I just put my foot down. I said, No, man. You know, we're in this car and you're going home with me. <laughs> you're not going off for another wild evening because we have a show tomorrow night. You know, you want out? He, 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 you know, yeah, I went out, of course. He, he, uh, you know, a man, because he was in the monkeys and in a band and had all these other people, he didn't develop a, a thing that I did because I've always been a solo performer. If I'm not totally, uh, 
full of energy and rested and focused, the show really suffers because there's nobody else that can pick up the slack. I'm on stage by myself. And so I'm always thinking, at least 24 hours in advance, I'm beginning to think about the next show. You know, the night before a show, I don't stay up late. I don't drink. I don't get high. I don't get, you know, have hot monkey love. I go to bed early. I, I get up. I sleep as late as I can. I make the whole day be about the show that night. And it's because I'm you know, all by myself. Peter could. He had more leeway because if he wasn't on his game, there was still, you know, the other three monkeys and a full band that could pick up the slack. So I understand why he didn't develop that particular uh, thing. You know, I did 30 years on the road or 40 years on the road by myself. So I had to evolve that. He did not have to evolve that, you know. And most guys in a band do not evolve that because they've got their buddies. They've got Someone's got their back. When you're a solo performer, nobody has your back. So you knew Jennifer from a cloud? Yeah, I did know Jennifer. I thought she was wonderful. I loved her a lot. Actually, I had kind of a case on her, man. I thought she was great. Yeah, lovely woman. They were together quite a while. Yeah. Well, you know what, man? I think when they got together, she pretty much, you know, saved Peter. He was uh, he was at a, a particularly low point in his uh, in his heart, I guess, in his life. And she was very nurturing and supportive. And I, I, they met in the program and, and she took him in and and really, you know, like nursed him back to health. And then uh, I know she went on the tour when the monkeys went to Australia. I think that she went on that tour. Yes, it, she did go on that tour because we, he called me and we, we met him at the airport and we had dinner with he and Jennifer at the, uh, at that, at that strange uh, arc air restaurant that was at the LAX then, you know, life intrudes, man. And, uh, and the situation, his situation changed so dramatically that I guess they just slowly un, un, unraveled, you know, I know that she did uh, she did some some costuming for the monkeys and right. I still have a sweatshirt that uh, that she gave me that has a whole bunch of arrows on it pointing in every direction and all the arrows say any which way but down. <laughs> That's a good motto. She was a positive influence to, on him I think. We're what did Peter think of the monkeys music? Did he did he ever did he enjoy it, or was it an albatross, or was he? You know what, man? As I say, on that first tour, he really was trying to to reestablish himself as though there weren't any monkeys. It, it, you know. So the new monks is not a, a cut-off version of monkeys. There's no reference whatsoever to the monkeys. God forbid. We don't I... want to remind him of that, do we? No, heaven forfend. Uh, are you uh, enjoying so... yourself more on your own than you did when you were with the group? Uh, about the same, actually. Yes, to the group. And the audience. Uh, has there? everybody formed their own? Each thing? person's doing his own thing mm -hmm. in his tour, but uh, do you I don't, friends? it's not my day to follow them, so I don't know what they are. You don't remain. Sure. And over the course of our, our tour, like by the time we did the first album together, we did uh, a Daydream Believer. You know, and he started, he slowly started accepting the idea that this was part of his past, a legitimate part of his past. And I think it also helped that, uh, that I thought they made some fabulous records. I, I don't care who sang what, uh, you know, Daydream Believer, uh, uh, Last Train to Clarksville, uh, Pleasant Valley Sunday. I loved doing that song with Peter. It was just a great song. A little bit me, a little bit you. One of the best records I ever heard. They just, you know, they made some great records, and and I was uh, unabashed in my in my uh, enthusiasm for them, you know. And I think that as more and more people that he loved and respected said, "Hey, those are good records," that he started going, "Yeah," because he he totally embraced it. Uh, totally embraced it. But before we'd finished touring together, he was. Yeah, I think it was only about the first year we were together that he had any any uh, trepidation about embracing his past, you know. Did he have any um, mementos or did he save anything from those days? Did you ever see anything? Did he ever show you any? You know what, man? His, uh, his mother saved a bunch of stuff. I remember seeing it in a in his house in a closet. There were like gold records in there and stacks of magazines. And he said, oh yeah, I think, 
I could be wrong. I, I thought he said his grandmother saved some yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's his, his grandmother. His grandmother. Yeah, okay. So so he uh, he had all that stuff, but, but you know, it it wasn't arranged. It wasn't uh, categorized or 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 you know put in any kind of fashion. It was simply all in a closet, just just kind of tossed it in there. What motivated him to move back to the family home in Connecticut? That was mysterious to me. Because I remember when we were early in touring, uh, he was talking about how angry he was with his parents when they moved from Wisconsin to Connecticut. Born in D.C., moved to Detroit and Berlin, Germany, and a couple of towns in Wisconsin, all before we settled more or less uh, finally in Connecticut. He said they lived in Madison, Wisconsin. He said, I was a city boy and they... They didn't even uh, check with me. They just moved to Connecticut and, and you know, disregarded me and they moved me out to the country. And I, you know, I was totally a fish out of water. And My parents, uh, I think they, I think they, I was okay as long as I was just a generic kid. Uh, as soon as I was who I really am, they, they saw that as a challenge somehow or other. Um, my father and I were jogging down the road one day and he said, uh, you want to stop? And I said, no. He said, so you want to race, huh? Every time I thought I did something good, my father said, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back. You know, and his voice is, oh, yeah, okay, Dad, okay, okay, okay. And I said, geez, uh, well, why do you think that they moved to Connecticut? He said, I don't know. My father took a job there, and that was that. And they didn't even, he, he almost, he wouldn't forgive his parents for moving to Connecticut without checking with him. And at the time, what was he, eight? You know, so when we got to Connecticut, uh, I was talking to his, I liked his parents a lot. And I was talking to his dad and I said, so Torque, what? he was called Torque too, by the way. I said, so why, why did you move to Connecticut and dig this? He said, well, when I, when I finished college in Madison, I put out, you know, feelers for jobs. And there was a job offered down at the Southern end of Illinois on the Kentucky border. And I thought, well, that's pretty close to the family because the family was all in Wisconsin. So I thought I can, I'll, I'll go down and look at that gig. If I can take that gig, I will, because it, it won't move the family so far from everybody else. So he goes down there and discovers that they have colored only white uh, bathrooms, black bathrooms, colored bathrooms, colored water fountains, all this. And he saw that bigotry and he said, I, I did not want my kids to grow up in an environment of such bigotry. So I took the only other gig I was offered, which was in Connecticut. So in fact, he was thinking of his family when he moved there, but Peter didn't know that. And so I told him, and we got in a fight about that. No, I wasn't, and I said, Peter, check with him. He moved there because he wanted to protect you guys from, from uh, ignorance and bigotry. You know? well, Peter uh, Peter said that he was contemplating suicide at age 13. Did he ever discuss that with you? Uh, you know what? I, I Somebody told me that, and I have to tell you, I never heard uh, him say anything like that. I remember at uh, when I was 13, uh, I put a loaded gun to my head, loaded and cocked. And uh, eventually put it down. And a couple of days later, I sort of realized or decided that I had preferred to live. Um, part of it was that I really wanted them to get how angry and distressed I was. But I also wanted to be around to watch them, <laughs> to watch them go through the changes. And I just realized they didn't have both, couldn't do both. And so I had to let the um, I'll show them side of it go. So if he was contemplating it, it must have been pretty brief. And uh, I mean, when you were try to think back when you were thirteen, everything was was so enormous. Every you know, the girl broke up with you. The you got a D in geometry, whatever. These things were you know enormous uh, to to you. So he might have been responding to some thirteen year old thing. Plus, when you're going through adolescence, you're you're going through some, some chemical changes that are profound, you know? 
we have to give ourselves permission to see ourselves as damaged people. I woke up to my life, to my adult life, damaged. I was damaged. Not very many people in this world escape being damaged. Anytime you weren't noticed for the real who and why of yourself, you were damaged. I do some pretty serious weeping from time to time. Come to grips with the damage in my own life. It's nobody's fault. My parents were damaged also, and they did the best they could with the damage that they brought into their lives. But, you know, I didn't escape the damage that was done to them. All I have is the chance to work on it. What were his parents like? Really bright. I asked my mother, I said, Mother, uh, were you happy to know that you were pregnant with me? And she said, oh, yes, my darling, you don't understand. Uh, it meant that I was an adult and my mother couldn't tell me what to do. <laughs> ah, you get it. See? My mother didn't get it. And, th and she said this, you know, Thursday. Um, <laughs> Well, they were yes. teachers, weren't they? Didn't they yes, come from they were both, both teachers. teachers. Yeah. Peter told me a story about uh, about the piano. He was mad at his mom because when he started playing the piano, he just started playing it by ear, you know. And his mother said, well, you know what? Uh, uh, you seem to have some gift for it, so I'm going to give you lessons. And he said, I don't want any lessons. And, and, uh, and he was whatever he was, 10 years old or something. And she said, look, I, you know, it's important for you to get, you don't want to form a bunch of bad habits. So it's important that you get proper instruction on how to, how to do that. No, I, I don't want to, it'll ruin my natural abilities or whatever. So she said to him, you either take the lessons or I won't let you play the piano. And I understand why she was doing that. She, she felt that he should have some instruction. And, uh, and he felt that, 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 the man stifled, stifled him. So we had arguments about that all, all the way through his life. He never, never actually forgave his mom for that. So I think his mom was, was right to do that, but he thought she was wrong. You know? Did he that. discuss with you what, what made him go west to yes. California? He has, he has this uh, apocryphal story, which <laughs> I never gave too much credence to, but it's the story he's always told. And, and he said that he was walking down the street in, in New York City, and a voice came to him and said, go to California. And then one day I heard from on high, get out of doubt. It really was a voice from on high. I have no idea. I'm not a very mystical guy, but this is what happened to me. And uh, I said, okay, okay. And I landed in L.A. in uh, June, late end of June, 1965. And I think I was auditioning for the Monkees by August or so. And... Uh, he ignored it the first time and it happened again, and he thought, well, I better go. So he did. I mean, I walked into a room full of nervous young hopefuls and walked in and put my feet up on the producer's desk. When he put his feet up on, I put my feet up on. He offered me a cigarette. I said, I don't smoke those. He said, well, you know, we can't allow you to go around getting stoned on the show. I said, no, no, I'm a professional. <laughs> It took me because, uh, also because I brought this character, the dummy character that mm -hmm. I played on the, on the screen was a character I developed over the years yeah, on the village stages. Anyway, it worked well for me then, and served me well for several years afterwards, and was a millstone around my neck for years after that. So uh, to the point where I now carry around at New York Times just to show everybody, you know, that I'm not really stupid. And I remember I, I came to New York City some months after that, maybe a month after he left. And he was living at 365 Broom Street, fifth, fifth floor walk up. And uh, my pal Richard and I, you know, found a parking space because we were going to stay with him. And, and, and we, we went up there and the door was ajar. And I went in there and the place was, it was trashed, you know. And, uh, and I think there was a note where, uh, and it wasn't a note to me, it was just a note saying, uh, that he'd gone to California, big doings. I remember those words, big doings, <laughs> Peter. And, and so we, you know, we used the bathroom and we left. What were some of the times when you were pissed at him? Oh, well, you know, that, that has to happen in, uh, sometimes we would do a tour where we would be gone like six weeks and it was just, you know, the two of us in the car in each other's faces on the stage in the, 
I remember playing in, I think it was Wilmington, South Carolina, where a joint called the Rusty Nail, where I did my sound check. It usually takes me about, I mean, in guitar and voice, it takes me about eight minutes, 10 minutes to do a sound check, you know, unless there's something really problematic. So I did my 10 minute sound check. And then Peter did a sound check from five o'clock until quarter of nine, which was 45 minutes after the show was supposed to start. And he made the guys go and get another board, replace that board. And, and I just thought that there's only the two of us and, the, and, the, you know, a three hour and 45 minute sound check for guitar and voice and banjos just seemed <laughs> a bit excessive, you know? So I was really mad with him. We had a, we had a big fight after that in the car. Uh, we never came to fisticuffs, but boy, we, we were pretty enraged that evening, shouting at each other and stuff. I told him what I thought about that whole thing, about it being self-indulgent and unprofessional and, he took umbrage <laughs> with those kind of accusations, you know. Uh, now, I remember one other time uh, where we were doing, uh, we had one of those sets, man. It was, it was so good. And, and uh, I used to wear these fry boots with this big, thick heel. And we finished this one song, and we knew that the, that the next song was going to be uh, uh, Pleasant Valley Sunday. And I started stomping my foot with the time, and then I play the lick, da -da, da -da 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 -da, you know, because it was like right out of the people were still applauding. And I started this thing because I could feel this fantastic momentum. And, and you know, we started doing that thing and I counted and I'm playing it. And just before we sing, Peter goes, stop, stop, stop. And I went, what? He said, let's do it a little slower. And I, <laughs> you know, it was, it was like, imagine you're about to have an orgasm and your wife goes, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, I was so angry that, that after after the, we went back to the dressing room, for, you know, because that was our last turn of the set. And I said, don't you ever do that to me again. Don't you ever stop the momentum in the show. You know, I was so pissed. Those are about the only two times I remember us ever fighting, you know. It was kind of an odd call, don't you think? Because, you, you, you know, you, I, 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 it was, I know what it's like on stage when you feel that thing. Yes, this is where we go into this song right here. And the audience responds instantaneously. You know, oh, it was, it was Decision. It was it was really orgasm time, and he stopped it dead. And I don't to this day know why what possessed him to. Uh, and also the the lick is da 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 da. You know, I'm not such a great player that I could play that too fast. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I mean, I thought it was in the pocket, and the it just felt like the momentum. You know, you, you know, it's like. When you're surfing and you, and the wave starts to curl and you you catch it and and you get that ride, we were right there, and and he let the wave go by, he, he okay. literally stopped us from riding that wave. And I, as I say, I uh, I really came down on him, and it never happened again in the whole rest of our lives, you know. So I must have been, I must have had some impact on on him him considering that. Oh. <clears throat> <laughs> you know what man I remember him getting pissed at me once when I was really really angry and I was I was letting my you know I was cursing and screaming and you know just just being a, throwing a tantrum essentially and he said James what gives you the right to think you can give yourself permission to be so engorged and it, and it was like wow He's right. Why am I giving myself permission to be a complete and utter asshole? You know? <laughs> so he stopped me then. I remember another time I was picking him up at the airport in, uh, in Boston. And I showed up. We had a gig that night and I showed up on, you know, ready to pick him up and drive to the other end of the state. And I'm there at baggage claim and no one comes out. And I go inside and I say, I'm looking, did this flight come in? They said, yes, the flight came in. I said, are the bags off? Yes, all the bags are off. And so then I went to the other counter and I said, look, I'm supposed to pick up somebody here and uh, I can't find them. And, and they said, well, we, you know, we're not permitted to give you. And I said, look, I'm picking up Peter Tork. We're doing a concert. Can you just tell me if Peter was on the plane? That's all I'm asking. 
And so they said, well, you know, we're not supposed to, but, and they checked and they said, yes, he was on the plane. I'm thinking, okay, I've now been at the airport an hour and a half. I can't find him. It turns out that he decided to wait in the drop-off area instead of the loading zone. So he was up on the other level where you drop people off to catch a plane. And I was down below. You pick people up. A baggage plane. <laughs> and we had a big fight about that. <laughs> he couldn't understand why I was so upset. And I couldn't understand why somebody would be so stupid as, as, to, as to wait in the drop-off thing. You know, this wasn't his first rodeo. I, I don't know what was going on there. So. Well, not, yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that over, over 50 years, we're talking about three times, <laughs> you know, that's I, extraordinary. I say, I'm surprised it was so few. Well, he, you know, he, there was, yeah, there was a lot of love between us and a lot of, uh, I don't know, man, we were connected, you know. What are some of the, the um, poignant things he said or did around you? The point of things. Are there any moments uh, either with fans or his personal life where you just saw a side of him that uh, maybe you only got to glimpse at a few times? You know what? I think I think that I've already addressed that. He would be so available to anybody in the program. And he would also be available to anybody that uh, – if anybody was having any kind of problem, I remember there was some young girl who was uh, what they call a cutter. She cut herself. I, I don't understand the, the entire thing, but there are some people who actually take a, a razor blade or a, a knife of something, you know, scissors, something, and they cut themselves. And he was helping some young girl that was doing that, you know, and, and he would, he would help people that I, that I thought were, insane you know they would come around and and uh, be so strange and he would he would help them he would he would take the time he was you know he was very compassionate dude very compassionate were there any incidences with fans overstepped the line yeah yeah i remember uh, playing the iron horse in in northampton and uh and these two young women, it was actually a mother and daughter, and they were looking for the bathroom, which was, the dressing rooms were downstairs, and so were the restrooms. And we were in uh, the dressing room, which was a big room, and it didn't actually have a door, I mean, a, a, a closing door. Uh, and these two women walked in, and right into the dressing room, and then they stopped dead because they were confronted with Peter Tork, the monkey, and and they were huge fans. And and he he thought, you know, what are you doing walking into my dressing room? The show has a story. You know, he just was enraged. And they were they were just looking for the bathroom, but he thought that they he thought that they you know came down there and just came into his dressing room without even being invited. And uh, that wasn't the case, but that's that's what he thought happened. And and. Uh, he felt that they'd overstepped their bounds, that there was, you know, one of the things that I like to do and, and uh, Peter liked to do was to have that time before you perform when you, when you gather in all of your, your sense of self and you, and you try to access all the gifts you have and you try to make that all coalesce before you go out on stage so that you can, you can offer to the audience everything that you could possibly give them that you have access to, you know? So he felt like attacked, you know, that they came in there like that. So do you recall Peter talking about his experiences with the post sixties albums they made, for instance, we'll go back to 1987 pool it the record that the three of them did. Yeah, no, I, I remember I, I was, uh, I submitted songs for all of those projects and I was there for the, for the release. And I was sometimes in the studio, with them for those things. Was Pool the first album they did when they came back together? Yes. Okay, because I remember going to Peter and saying, Peter, this is really an opportunity for the monkeys. I would like to suggest that rather than, than do your headquarters, you know, we're going to write all the tunes thing, 
keep in mind that the monkeys, when they when they started, had some of the greatest songwriters and the greatest musicians in the world at the time in that genre, providing you know the material for the album. If I were you guys, I mean, I would love for you to do some of my songs, and I know you'd like to do some of your own songs, but what I'd like to suggest is you go out and you find the best 20 songs in the world you can find and record them, and then you take the best 10 of those and put that album out and show these people who you guys are. And and uh, they talked about that. Evidently, Peter presented it to them, and they considered it as an idea. But Davey said, well, there's four of us, and we're doing 12 songs. Three of the songs are going to be mine, no matter what. And and when Davey put his foot down, the other guys went, well, if if he's going to have his songs on there, then I'm going to have my songs on there. And that was the end of that, you know. Was he happy with the results of that album, or you? Uh, <clears throat> I I never uh, I never got uh, into that album at all, and uh, I know they were disappointed in the sales. The next time was '97 when they reunited the four of them, and they did an album called Justice that they played their own instruments on, and they did a TV yeah, reunion. Yeah, I, I was I was in the studio for that too. That was that was all. Michael was the uh, he was really calling all the shots for that record, as I recall. I mean, it, it was supposed to be the four of them, and I. But when I was there, it seemed like the final say was Michael's on that record. You know. Then they went on to um, Good Times, which was uh, not in 2016. Yeah, and no, see, I I hadn't uh, Peter been living on the on the East Coast now for you know, more than a decade, I think, or at least a decade. And, and that was a monkey's thing. I, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have any interaction with that at all. And I, I don't think he even sent me the recording. So America, I know he did not send me the recording, which is when I think about it in retrospect, sort of odd. So maybe he didn't like that so much. I don't know. What do you think was P Peter's happiest period? I do remember that that when I brought him down to Norfolk, Virginia to record, it seemed like a time of enormous uh, hope and optimism and anything was possible. And here he was, uh, you know, playing basket houses in New York and he comes down to Norfolk, Virginia and he sells out a week of shows and, and the audience adores him. And the paper does a full page Sunday spread on him. And, you know, it, it was... I mean, it, he must have been that happy many other times, but I think that was the first time he was ever that that happy with with who he was and what he was doing, you know? And what year was that? What era was that? 65. Now, you have, uh, you're have you working on a documentary about yourself. Tell us, tell oh, us what you're right. doing now. That's right. The documentary actually was finished last week, and it's called uh, the, the Opening Act, The Extraordinary Journey of James Lee Stanley. And it, it 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 starts out, of course, with my nascency and goes through, you know, me growing up and then going on the road as it happens without the benefit of, uh, for most of my life, without the benefit of a manager or an agent or a record label. I have managed to be on tour with everyone from Robin Williams to Robin Trower to, to the Dixie Dregs to... Uh, I mean, everybody, if you could, if you could, Michael Murphy, uh, Poco, uh, you know, if, if you couldn't think of someone, I was probably on the road with them as the opening act. And this happened because I was extremely lucky and because I could actually go out on stage with one guitar and turn a crowd into an audience. You know, I was Stephen Wright's opening act for three years and frequently the unannounced opening act. And the fact that I could go out there with one guitar means there was there wasn't a great uh, stage change, you know. So I mean, I realized there was some logistics that that made it. But there's a lot of solo guys. The fact that I got to do it so much is what the documentary is about. It's well, it's a tremendous gift, uh, and, and it's yeah, congratulations. And, and it, great, thank you. 
So what do you think Peter's legacy is? Or how will he be remembered down the road in the future? Wow. You know, I hope that uh, that Peter's legacy involves someone who uh, achieved some wonderful celebrity and and never lost his uh, his humanness or his compassion or his kindness, you know, and never lost his love for music. He, he was he was really just crazy for music, you know. Loved it. That was part of our bond. He was a remarkable friend. That there's a what? legacy for you. He was he was a he was a great friend. You know how few of those there are in your life? You could probably count them on your one hand, man. If you have a friend, that's one thing. And if they're loyal, that's the real bonus. Yep. Yep. When you think about your all the time you spent with Peter, what's what comes to mind overall? Is there a, a, just a sentiment or a picture that comes to mind that yes. kind of sums him up totally? You know what? Just how much fun we had on stage. We would go up there together, and and also, if you look at the photographs, man, there is the 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 joy and the love between us being in the spotlight together like that is palpable. You can see it in, in every photograph. We're just, you know, just having such a good time and and having such a high regard for each other. It's just very very sweet, you know. That's my memories of him. It's just, and I remember. Uh, I guess it was three years ago now. I said, Peter, we should go out and do, you know, one more fail world tour because we're, we're all, uh, you know, getting close to the edge. This was before he had, this was while the country was still in remission. And, and he, and he said, yeah, that was about three years ago because he said, James, I'll tell you the truth, man. I, I, I'm not sure I have the energy. I'm I'm uh, I'm struggling a lot more than than I'm uh, letting people know. And that's when I realized, whoa, this is uh, this is some serious stuff. But well, he uh, he kept his brave face to the end, so to speak. Right to the end, man. Even you know, even in that last conversation. What are you doing, Peter? I'm just waiting. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? Waiting for the train to show up for the the uh, the downbound train, you know. Did you have any conversations with Pam? How would how did she handle the whole thing? Uh, I did not, but but Leah Kunkel, who uh, is not only Peter's and my lifelong friend, but uh, an attorney and the executor, I think, she said that Pam was spectacular; that she was there for Peter one hundred percent all the time. Remarkable woman. Well, that's, that's good it. to know. And thank yeah. you, Pam, for that. Yeah. Did he change your life? You know what? He really did. And and quite uh, inadvertently, because I produced a solo album on him, and, and I did it for completely altruistic reasons, I'd, I really, A, I really did not know, I didn't grasp how famous he was. And I, I just thought that he was, he was languering, and he loved music. And why didn't I help him out? From doing that, uh, it, it ended up that he, MTV did that uh, unplugged thing, and so he decided. Uh, I said, "Well, you should go out and do an unplugged thing, man." And he said, "Well, why don't you come with me?" And so I just went with him because, you know, I produced this record, and I, I was going to be the opening act, and. Through a time, we started doing tunes together, and and then the fans, his fans, went crazy for what we did together, and and all of those people that became fans of mine through him are still with me, and so he changed my life in that respect for sure because he he brought uh, he brought a whole new audience to me that that didn't know I existed, and and also uh, producing him gave me a legitimacy as a producer that. Uh, Perhaps I didn't uh, enjoy before. Any last, um, any last things you want to say? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. You know what, uh, Peter, wherever you are, pal, I wish we'd wish we'd play together more. The one thing about Peter, no matter how much time we spend together, it never felt like enough, you know? Singing, singing in the rain, singing in the rain, ha, huh? just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling. I'm happy again. Ready? As ready as I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. 